Hey, you guys. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to weekly live Q&A. Uh, hashtag no more shame <laughs> if you're over on Twitter. Um, we are all here to support one another. And this is a place where adult survivors of trauma come every single week to share support, receive support, and um, we discuss a lot of topics on this channel for the most part. We discuss CPTSD, we discuss childhood trauma, any type of childhood trauma, childhood abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, verbal, cult abuse, any type of abuse that happened during childhood after effects in adulthood. So welcome, welcome, if that is what you're looking for. Um, that's who this channel and who this video is for. I'll tell you who it's not for. If you're a cyber bully or you have nothing better to do than to click the thumbs down button um, because you want to terrorize other people who are trying to heal from trauma, you're not welcome here. So you can just cruise along, do another video. That would be fantastic. Uh, we have a zero tolerance policy. You'll be blocked if you decide to spew ridiculousness or hate speech. Um, everyone that arrives here deserves to be unconditionally accepted. And um, this is a safe place for you to come share support and receive support. So welcome, welcome. Uh, these videos are not ever a substitute for professional health care, medical care, uh, mental health care. We, this is a peer-led group, and every video on this channel is shared from a lived experience perspective. So that's who we are and what we're about, and I'm really happy that you guys are here. It is the, the Monday after Thanksgiving in 2017, and um, so many of us have um, experienced a lot of ups and downs in the winter holidays in years past and perhaps are anticipating some ups and downs in the winter holidays coming up in the month of December and January. So just want to um, check in super quick um, and just see if the audio is okay. Um, I know whenever I use this microphone, sometimes the audio is a little crazy. Um, How's the audio, you guys? Can you hear me okay, or is it making a, a weird, like, uh, like crazy sound like it did last week? Hoping it's good. Um, I'm hoping it's good. I'm just going to cruise along as though it's good. I'm going to try not to touch my shirt. I have this, like, nervous tick that I do where... If I feel like any like piece of my clothing is like shifting and it could be like mostly in this general area, I will like tug at my clothing obsessively, impulsively, because I'm like, uh, it's just it's one of those like hiding things, right? Like I just like I wanna be like <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, this is live. This is live. Oh good, good, audio is good. I'm so happy, I'm so happy. Okay, so welcome, welcome, you guys. I'm so excited. Um, thank you, Monica, for sending in your question already. Thank you, John Harvey. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Shelly. I'm so excited to be here. So, um, so this series was going to just be titled Habits to Live By. And I'm um, in keeping with partnering with um, suicide prevention, and it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm a member of our our local suicide prevention task force here where I live and um, we always share suicide prevention hotline information here on this channel by the way um, please do reach out to suicide uh, suicide prevention hotline is it suicide lifeline suicide lifeline.org um, I believe is let me just double check now it's gonna drive me crazy I want to make sure I get the right name right you guys um, and then also um, crisistextline.org, you can text the word START to 741741 and there's a conversation that will start and you'll be greeted by a crisis counselor that can help you if you're in any type of crisis, suicidal crisis, depression, 
um, any, any, any type of crisis. So they're there to help you. Um, let me just go through really quick. I want to make sure that I give you the proper suicide prevention um, information so that you guys can share it. Um, trigger warning, by the way. We're going to be discussing um, abuse, healing from abuse, uh, any type of complex trauma, CPTSD symptoms, emotional flashbacks, uh, PT PTSD flashbacks, and other um, symptoms. And sometimes the questions that come in, in our, from our community, when I read them out loud, they contain graphic details, so trigger warning. Um, if you are a survivor of rape, abuse, or incest, please reach out to our friends over at RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network. And you can find a 24-7 uh, chat feature on their website, rainn.org, or you can call them on the phone, 1-800-656-HOPE, H-O-P-E, or H-O-P-E is 1-800-656-4673. Um, there we go. And then the suicide prevention um, is suicideprevention.lifeline.org. Or you can dial them if you're in the U.S. at 1-800-273-8255. Okay, so welcome, welcome. I'm super excited you're here. If you made it here for the live chat, would you give this video a thumbs up? Because the more thumbs up and the more shares and the more comments after the video is done, uh, then the, the higher up in the search rankings that YouTube and Google put the video and then more survivors find our channel, which is always super exciting. So thanks for being here. You guys are amazing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read your guys' questions. And tonight what we're doing, we're doing a, something a little bit different, but kind of keeping in the same vein with what we always do. And that is we're going to share uh, tips and strategies. I'm going to answer your questions, of course. But we're going to enlist the, we're going to phone a friend. We're going to enlist the audience participation over in the YouTube chat box. And we're going to be doing this for a few weeks. So please get the word out, be tweeting people on Twitter, sharing on Facebook, letting people know if they are struggling with an abuse situation from childhood, perhaps within the family unit or wherever they're going to be traveling during the winter holidays, send them over to our channel so that they can at least um, watch some videos and maybe get some helpful tips that you all are going to be sharing and that I will be sharing with you, um, with everyone, as I read your questions. So it'd be good if we like, just old people about what's going on over here, right? Especially during the holidays. So Monica, Monica says, how do I stay strong when I am being hoovered to reinstate contact over the holidays and not go into a toxic guilt spiral for staying true to my healing journey? So we're going to be using a lot of jargon in this, probably in the next few weeks. So hoovering, if you want to Google the word hoovering, um, put the word hoovering in quotes on Google and then put a comma and then type in narcissistic abuse. And then you'll get an entire myriad of choices and videos and um, definitions and websites and blogs and memes and um, other helpful images and, and helpful quotes that will pop up if you're wondering what's hoovering and, um, and what's narcissistic abuse recovery and if you're just wondering. So Monica wants to know how she can stay strong when she's being hoovered to reinstate contact. So what Monica is sharing is that she's previously gone no contact or low contact with a toxic family member and now that it's the holidays she's being sort of guilted into like showing up. And this happens every year. I was telling a, a colleague and a client of mine uh, today on the phone that right now the next six weeks of my life, like last week, this week, and then the future four weeks, um, last week, this week, and then four weeks from now, those are the busiest weeks of my entire year. I sort of ramp up for it, right? Because I help people heal from trauma, and trauma is cumulative, and much trauma comes from childhood, and so it repeats itself as we um, are in situations that are reminiscent of the trauma that happened during childhood. So what Monica is basically asking is, I, Monica, have gone low contact or no contact with my family members because I have deemed them toxic and now I am feeling obligated to show up during the holidays and um, how can I not go into a toxic guilt spiral for staying true to my healing journey and Monica my answer to this because I've dealt with this personally and professionally 
my answer to this is to uh, keep a list. This is why journaling is so, 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 so helpful, you guys. Because we look back on, on our journaling that we did, even if we only do like two sentences, even if we just do one sentence a day, even if it's only a couple of words a day, that daily practice of writing down how we're feeling in our recovery journey, um, the five-year journal is super duper helpful because it you keep one journal for five years, it's hardcover, and, um, and there's a little, like there's a date, and then there's like one, two, three, four, five little sections, and like, for the first year, you fill out this one little section, and then you go through the whole journal, and you come back the second year, and you're like, wow, look at how far I've come. And then you keep doing it. And then the third year, you're like, wow, ooh, wow, look where I am now. And look, oh, you know what, this is similar. And so the five-year journal is one of my favorite ones. I wish I had a link to send you, but I don't have a link to send you, but the five-year journal is amazing. But Monica, so Monica, excellent question. So many uh, adult survivors of childhood any type of childhood trauma, abuse, uh, maltreatment of any kind, are going through the same feelings. They're like, "How am I gonna, how am I gonna not break my low contact or no contact? But how am I also not gonna fall into a guilt and shame spiral because I need to be the good daughter?" Or they um, see what happens is a lot of our toxic loved ones they use their favorite type of language to describe us especially during the holidays. So they use shaming language. They use, um, they, and they use um, things against us that they know we care about. So for instance, I happen to know Monica a little bit. I happen to have the privilege of knowing her, um, getting to know her a little bit um, away from just our, our Monday nights. And I know that Monica holds very dear um, her, her spiritual path, her spiritual journey. And so I'm assuming, I'm only assuming Monica, I can't assume to know the, the details, but what happens with a lot of my clients and with me personally as well, they'll use that spiritual path that we're like really, um, that we hold very dear to our hearts and they'll be like, oh, you know, you're so enlightened. Like if you were so enlightened or you're so, you know, faith filled or you're, you know, such a, you know, such a spiritual person, like what type of person would just not talk to their family during the holidays? And, you know, you're so ungrateful. And, I, you know, we clothed you and we fed you and we, we, we took care of you for the first half of your life. And now here you are and you're so ungrateful and you're just so this. And, you know, what kind of person are you? And I really didn't expect this type of behavior from you. And you're so selfish. And why can't you just get over yourself? And why aren't you over it by now? That was a long time ago. And they, they, they flip the script and they just shame you and they make it, they make it all about um, your perceived character flaws when in all actuality what's going on the reason that you have gone no contact or low contact is not due to your perceived um, character flaws or or uh, other types of flaws that you may have but it is di a direct response to the fact that they have violated you in some way whether it be a physical boundary an emotional boundary any type of a boundary they've they violated that they they have shown their true colors and they have invaded your sense of self and so so that they don't have to own that or take responsibility for their actions they flip the script and then they shame you and they use words that they know will just dig and cut um, so my best answer for you Monica is that I would um, make a list on like a little post-it note if you can of um, just five of the reasons why you chose to go low contact or no contact with these particular um, loved ones and just have that reminder nearby like and, and just have it be like a reflection of like your own journey like I value my mental health I value my emotional well-being I value my sense of self I, I value my my strong character I'm I'm on a path this is my spiritual journey these are things I value in my life. The people that I'm choosing to not be in contact with don't have the same values. They don't have the same moral compass. They're not made of the same moral fiber that I am. Or they choose to be exploitative or rude or negative or unkind towards others or towards animals or towards other family members. They're, very, they're bullying. They, they make it all about themselves. Uncle Joe drinks too much every time we get around one another as a family and it's very triggering for me and it reminds me of this, this, that, or that and, and it sends me into a spiral and it could just be 
I just want, then and here's, here's just a blanket statement for everyone tonight. It could be as simple as, I just want to be by myself this year because that feels like a healthy choice. We don't owe anybody any explanations. We just don't. We're all adults here. We don't answer to anybody anymore. If you're watching this channel and you're not an adult yet, this channel is for adults. We are adult survivors of childhood trauma. So if you are still under the age of 18 and you're not out on your own and you can't make your own decisions yet, then, then this is going to be very hard for you to relate to. But if you are an adult and you don't owe anybody an explanation, you just get to say, oh, thank you, or maybe next year. Or I know I usually would be attending such and such event. This year I'm going to do something a little bit different. Perhaps I'll see you next year. You know, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, I love you, I wish you well, goodbye. Like, it's important to remind ourselves why we've made these healthy choices. It's important for us to remember. That's why our groups and our community is so powerful because it is a daily reflection and reminder of why we are on this path, why we are on this healing journey, why we care so much about our health because we not only see in our groups hundreds of other people, maybe even just a couple other people on any given day or dozens depends. It could be four or five. It could be dozens. It could be a hundred, depending on the day, depending on if there's a welcome. Like usually the welcome posts are like the most active. But we see in all of those people in the groups a reflection of us, either where we've been, where we are right now, or where we want to be. Or something we never even realized about ourselves a sense of resilience, a sense of strength, um, something we want to see in ourselves, right? That's why community is so powerful. So surround yourself with people that are on a similar mission to you, Monica. This goes for all of us here. I'm saying these things to myself as much as I'm saying them to you. Let's surround ourselves with people who are on a similar journey that we're on, and let's remember why we chose to chase after our health. Let's remember where we were and like how hard that was when we were like in the middle of that of, of the beginning stages of our recovery. And let's remember why we're on this path. Okay? So um, I'm super excited to be here with you guys. Can you tell? I've been away for a few days and so I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm so happy to see you. Um, which by the way, I don't know, um, I know that that um, many of you that are here right now um, are in the United States and some of you are in Canada, which I know that um, I got a nasty email from someone over the weekend that said, you don't even know when the Canadians celebrate Thanksgiving. And we don't celebrate Thanksgiving the same time you do. You're, you know, there were a lot of F words and there was just like, you know, it was like a really ugly email that I received. So I wish them a happy Thanksgiving or, you know, whatever. Uh, or I was talking about like, hey, you know, this is the type of year, this is the time of year when we celebrate Thanksgiving here in the United States. So anyway, I do happen to know when the Canadians celebrate Thanksgiving. By the way, I didn't respond to that person, but I could have, but I didn't. I chose not to. But like, I know the Canadians, um, all of our, our Canadian family members here, community members, they celebrate the second, it's either the first or second Monday in October. And, um, and then I know that... Um, there is not necessarily a, a Thanksgiving, but in a couple of different countries um, that we have our community members, there's more of like a celebration of like the harvest and the bounty, like celebrate what the land has brought, like the vegetables and the fruits and, and the things that we get from the land. So anyway, I'm not sure um, how many of you celebrated uh, a Thanksgiving holiday or any type of a holiday this past week. But if you did, I just want you to know that sometimes this time of year can be extremely um, painful or feel very lonely or detached for a lot of people. And I just want you to know I'm thinking of you. Because, um, you know, like we're not always surrounded by like our birth family or our family of origin and it can feel lonely. 
And um, those are the times when we need to um, be able to hopefully learn to surround ourselves with um, different friends and, and other loved ones that are on a similar path or that are respectful of our personal um, boundaries and um, and beliefs and um, that are just that care about overall well-being of other people and not just care about themselves if that makes any sense so um, John Harvey wants to know um, he says that he has a question um, for those that are alone how can they have a good holiday alone and you know I uh, I celebrated a couple of different holidays alone um, when my son left for the Marine Corps and it was almost very it was it was really hard for me it was very painful It was the first time I had been like alone alone like I lived by myself for the very first time in my life and I was like 30 something years old because I went straight from like my family to my, with my son's dad and then I had my son and then like then it was just the two of us all the way up until he left for the military and so I was finding myself 30 something years old and I was living it was my very first time living by myself like with my own space only and like not shared with anybody else and it was just so it was it was shocking at first just I didn't really know what to do with myself I had all this extra time and energy and it was a little unsettling and then I fell into a, a rhythm and I found things that I liked to do and it almost felt a little bit empowering but I don't want to minimize that feeling of loneliness if you are alone in this holiday season and it is painful for you. That is very, very, very common and it is, it is a natural thing to feel. And you're not, even though you feel all alone, um, there are others like this community that you're, that you're here watching and, and hopefully, you know, like getting plugged into if you want to. But many of us have been in that place of feeling lonely or alone and wishing that we could be more closely connected with other people during winter holidays. So I think one of the most uh, important things that you can do if you're by yourself and you want to enjoy is to find something that you enjoy doing, whether it's a hobby or like I remember what I did. So this was back in 2010. I joined a book club. I know that sounds incredibly nerdy, but I'm really, really, really nerdy if you don't know by now, like if you haven't been here for the last four years, but um, I'm, I'm really nerdy. I guess it's three and a half years. We've been on this channel for three and a half years. So um, I joined a book club and it really helped me to be around other people from all walks of life. Um, there's an app, it's a red app that you can look for on the App Store, the Google Play Store, and it's called Meetup. And there are um, several different types of meetups. Like there's meetups for people that own dogs. Um, I don't own a dog, but but I have a friend that goes to that meetup. And then there's one for people who who love to build websites, which I do. And I went to that one, and it was um, it's it's for my island that I live on, and it was everybody there just loves. They're like ranging from des um, web designers to to um, professional developers. So I'm kind of a newbie front end. Developer and so I you know went and I and I got hooked up with them and there's like a WordPress group and and anyway if you go if you find the little red app it says Meetup if you search the App Store or the Google Play Store um, if you're spending this holiday alone they have like you know day hikes or you know community events they even have um, some that are for like board games or like some people like different games have like kind of a following like there's um, like Uno, lots of people love to play Uno. Like there's like a Uno meetup, and um, depending on what kind of city you live in, like you know, there could it's probably a different type of meetup. Uh, and these are all like I know that these aren't like new, and like I watched this video and I didn't learn anything new. But like sometimes we don't need to come up with something new because there's really nothing new under the sun. This is just my lived experience and the advice that I have to share. So, John Harvey, I would tell your friend was wondering um, perhaps like if there's a hobby that they really like that maybe they haven't spent a lot of time doing like there's this woman who teaches um, watercolors and oil paints and she has classes at her um, at her house in like two towns over 
and it's down like under her house like in her garage area like towards her backyard and I've gone to one of those and it was like forty dollars or whatever and I you know just spent the day painting and um, and I realized that I have kind of a love for that and I really enjoy it I have all my paints and um, I have a little portable easel that I can take anywhere all over the island now and I have special watercolor paper and I have these little canvases and I have all these little these paints and I have special brushes and it's really it's just fun and then um, I went to one where I learned how to um, make hammered jewelry like um, you learn how to solder and there's like a flame and the whole thing and you have to buy the little pieces of solder and and I made these little um, hammered bangle bracelets with the little shells and then like you can purchase um, these pearls from people who go pearl diving and like you can put like a pearl and like um, like uh, use this little Dremel and like drill a hole in the pearl and like put the pearl on the bangle and then like solder it and then move the pearl back over so it covers up the little solder mark and it's all beautifully hammered and it looks very like those bracelets sell for like a hundred and something dollars and I I think I spent you know like twenty five dollars on materials and like fifteen dollars on the workshop and I have got like I walked away with like a hundred dollar bracelet you know and I got to learn a new skill so um, and I mean I'm not a professional painter I'm not a professional jewelry maker but I the important thing is that you pour yourself right because all we have is this right pour yourself into something that is just for you just for the enjoyment of you not necessarily a money-making activity revenue generating activity um, that, that feels almost frivolous like it doesn't have to be a spa day like I'm not a good relaxer Otherwise, I would spend money and go to spas, you know, because there's spa people all over the place. I used to work at a spa. But it's, you know, if you're not a good relaxer, find something you enjoy doing that you can pour yourself into. And these are good new habits that you can sort of adopt or new best practices that you can adopt. Or maybe find, a, if you, like, I took a cooking class. Like, and I'm learning how to cook. I'm 40 something years old. I'm learning how to cook for the first time. I'm not a good baker. I've tried to bake, and it's like I, I mess it up every single time. So, um, these are just some ideas, but they're really good ways to, to have a great holiday season, especially, even if you're just not like with other people. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a healthy distraction or it's a healthy way to spend your time. Learn things about yourself that you didn't even you know remember or know you know um, I hope that these answers are helpful Angela says how do we handle unsolicited contact from family Ooh, I had this recently Ooh, it was a rough situation I handled it but I'll probably handle it different next time <laughs> I'm gonna continue the question unsolicited contact from family sometimes it is expected during Christmas to talk to family and it never feels like it's on my terms but it's on their terms this is a great question Angela um, it is it is a difficult thing to handle unsolicited contact from family members when it is unexpected so for instance I had um, I was working on some trauma recovery back in like 2013, probably 2013. And I received an unsolicited email from one of my sexual abusers from when I was a little girl. And I hadn't heard from this person in 30 years. And I received an email. And it threw me for like a solid like probably eight weeks I just I had feelings of unsafety and I had something similar happen recently where it came in through the post office and which typically like you know like you said like you can't really you can't really ex expect everything right there's gonna be unexpected things but during the holidays it is expected and you can sort of bolster yourself so when I had those things hit me kind of hard and I have clients that had similar situations where they'll receive 
email correspondence or packages arrive from their abusive family members or from people out of the blue that they haven't been in contact with for like 15 years and it was not a good situation. The best way to handle these types of things is to find a way to ground yourself and find a way to practice self-care immediately as soon as possible when the feeling hits you. Like, like when stuff like this happens, when we receive unexpected contact or unwelcome contact from toxic loved ones, it can feel, and, and I'm only describing what I know to be true. So if it feels different for you, then fill in the blank. When you feel that like someone kicked you in the solar plexus or like someone punched you in the throat, like when it hits you and it hits you physically and you can feel your body responding, whether it's through tense shoulders or a kink in your neck or pain on one of your extremities, whatever this physical manifestation is that's happening, it is important to address that physical manifestation as soon as possible. It's not helpful for us to minimize the phys physical manifestations of, of emotional trauma. I'm gonna say that one more time because it's big. It is not ever helpful for us to minimize or shove away or deny the physical manifestations of emotional trauma. The words, that was a long time ago, why am I not over this by now, I can't believe I'm still responding this way, I'm already grown up, like what's my problem, those words are never going to be helpful in that moment. So when you feel the physical thing hit, or you feel the feelings of unsafety, or you feel the hypervigilance, or you can sense that you can feel a shift in your own energy because of the contact, the unwanted contact from the loved one, it is important that you find a way to ground yourself and to be very kind to yourself. Um, we talked a few years ago on this channel about calming boxes, like ha have like a little box that's filled with like, these are a few of my favorite things, you know, like your favorite um, type of tea, or um, I think some of the things that people put in these calming boxes were one, uh, one person had like um, a fidget toy, um, like some squishy, like a couple of squishy toys. One person had um, tea. Another person had like essential oils, different herbs. Um, someone had in um, what are those lemon heads? Uh, excuse me, um, sour, sour patch kids. Um, one person had um, what are those little things that turn into chalk that you get them at uh, Halloween sweet tarts. Um, things that were comforting for them that brought good memories. There's one person that had root beer flavored candies. I don't know where you get root beer flavored candies, but it was a fond memory of their childhood and they wanted to be taken away to another place. So think of something that whether it's a smell or a taste or something that takes you away to a pleasant place. Um, peppermint oil is really good for that because it's usually neutral. Peppermint uh, essential oil doesn't normally trigger old stuff unless of course one of your childhood traumatic memories is involving something that smelled like peppermint. But typically, peppermint oil is something that's pretty neutral, and it can take you out of a moment and place you somewhere else. Because the, the sense of smell is precognitive. You're already somewhere else before your brain even knows it. And so that's important to remember. And then sour candies, cinnamon, um, different flavors of tea, things that calm you. And the one that works across the board no matter what, if you are um, triggered, especially if you're triggered into an emotional flashback or you can sort of prepare for these things ahead of time, is um, putting your hands in ice water, water with ice cubes. Because what happens is when the ice water hits all of the different um, areas of our, of our hands, the different nerve endings, it disengages our hypothalamus. And so we're not able to, to have the typical trauma response that we would normally have. It disengages part of that. So that's a way to handle, a, handle it um, once it already has happened. As far as preparing ourselves for it ahead of time, um, Angela, like if you're like, okay, I know it's gonna happen, I'm just not sure when, then I would honestly write down some things that you know to be true. Because this is something that happens, you guys. When we receive unwanted correspondence, whether it's written 
or verbal or telephone like audio or it's you know something that happens and it's unwanted and it's unsolicited and it's from someone that's toxic what happens is we tend to go there we go there and it doesn't matter what we know to be true the sky is blue grass is green I like cheese <laughs> you know the basics um, which by the way I love cheese but so we don't stay in our realm when we receive unsolicited correspondence from loved ones. We tend to go to this place because we're triggered. That's what a flashback is. You're taken to another place that feels like it's the present, but it's not. So what's important in preparing for unsolicited and unwanted communication is to write down things that you know to be true. You know. I love these things about myself. These are things that I value about my character. I am these things in my community. This is who my, my children say that I am. I am these things to my boss. Talk about your identity. You know, um, if you're a spiritual person, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am safe. I am dearly loved. Um, I am acceptable. I am enough. Um, find, you know, I have um, this, there's something that someone sent me here um, this person that is in our community that happens to be a person of faith, um, this will help you. And if anybody's interested in, in this particular thing, I can share this in the groups or I can share it um, if you just want to send an email um, and let me know if you, if you want this. But it's, this is um, a person that is in our community that needed to be reminded who they were because their abuser tends to warp their way and like weasel their way in to their situation during the holidays and they begin to doubt who they are as a person because they they take on the identity that their their abuser and their toxic people say they are so there's this thing here and it's 50 things um, I am a child of God. I'm a new creation. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I am delivered, redeemed. I am holy and without blame. I'm established to the end. I've been brought closer to God. I'm victorious. I am free. I am strong. I am dead to sin. I am more than a conqueror. I am sealed. I am in Christ by his doing. I am accepted. I am complete. I am alive. I am free. I am reconciled. I am qualified. I am firmly rooted. I am called. I am chosen. I am the apple of his eye. I am healed. I am being changed. I am raised up. I am beloved. I have access to God. I have overcome. I have everlasting life. I have the peace of God. I walk in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, and I don't mean any of these things like, um, here's a little scripture, you know, go ahead, you'll be fine. Because these little scriptures alone are not the things that help us. It's reminders of who we are. And I want to talk about that just for a second. People who use scripture as like a band-aid and like as like, they just hand you a scripture and send you on your way like it's going to be, you know, enough to get you by. Like, what's wrong with you? Don't you know? Don't, don't you know what, what scripture says about you? Like, you know, what's your problem? So it's not these little scriptures in and of themselves that are, that are helpful in those moments or that are transformational. It's the reminder of what we already know to be true. Just like when... Um, like if you have a touchstone or um, people who have like a, like a ground, like something to help them keep them grounded. It's not that it's this piece of rock that's in their pocket. It's not this little charm they wear on their necklace. It, that doesn't help them. But it's where it takes them. It, it's what it reminds them of. It's where it, it's, it takes them out of the moment that they're in that happens to be difficult. And it's a reminder of what they know to be true. The whole purpose of me sharing any of this is when you receive unexpected correspondence or expected correspondence that's unsolicited and unwanted by toxic 
loved ones, it is important for you to find a way, whether it's through something like I just shared that is scripture-based, whether it's a sticky note, whether it's a touchstone or, or a rock or a piece of jewelry or something, you need to remember who you are and how far you've come and how healthy you are becoming and how many people you're helping and how many others you've met that have been in the similar situation that you're in and how far you've come from, from and you're on your healing journey from where you were compared, which is like, it's interesting because they're reaching out to you, right? They're reaching out to you. They're invading your personal space with their unwanted correspondence, whether it be by a greeting card or an email or a care package or a phone call or a text or something. They want you to remember them. But in these moments, I need you to remember you. I need you to remember the truth about who you are, the truth about where you've come from, the truth about how far you've come in your recovery. That's, that's the important thing. That's the important thing. Because these little pieces of paper or these little boxes or these little text messages, ding, 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 the, the, the phone call, like, those things, are they're, they're nothing. They're symbolic of something. Those text messages, those phone calls, those emails, the box that shows up, the greeting card that costs 89 cents or $5, depending on where you shop, you know, um, that's not what their goal is. Their goal is to get you diverted off of the path that you're on to remember them, to remind you of something, to derail you. And some people aren't even that vindictive and they don't even want to derail you. They just want to send a ding, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, thinking of you, XOXO, here's a care package, here's your favorite bottle of wine, I sent you your favorite author, his newest book, whatever it might be. If those things are unwanted, I need you to find something, whether it's a scripture verse or a piece of jewelry or a rock or a stone or a quote or a safe group or something that helps you remember who you are and how far you've come because that's where the power is. You've done a lot of work. If you're here on this channel and you're watching this video, it's because you're in the thick of it. You're in the trenches. You're doing it. You're doing the hard work. You're healing. And you deserve to continue healing. And you don't need to be derailed by anybody. So remember who you are. Remember who you are and how far you've come. Find something, whatever tool it might be, find something to help remind you so that you don't forget, so that you're strong. It's very important. Very, very important. Shelly says, I seem to have slipped into my scapegoat role with newer friends. How do I reverse this? Thanksgiving was hell. Well, I've done this. Shelly, <laughs> I've done this. Um, here I am cruising along, feeling super good, you know, went low contact, went no contact with some family, you know, over here on my safe little island, living my safe little life, recovery, you know, hashtag, <laughs> all the way, right? And then I make a new friend, and something feels like easy and effortless about it, almost like it's too good to be true. <laughs> and the next thing you know, boom, there I am, and I'm the scapegoat all over again. So. The only way I have found to reverse that, Shelly, is I slowly, slowly but quickly, if that makes any sense, I quickly, immediately, but casually, I go, I go gray rock. Google gray rock if you all are unsure. I'm using a lot of jargon on this video. It's going to drive people crazy if they don't know what I'm talking about. So gray rock, you immediately acknowledge 
acknowledge what it is that's going on, Shelly, and accept it for what it is. Do your best not to shame yourself with the whole, I should have known better, I can't believe I didn't see this coming, what was I thinking, I should have known, I should have known that it was too good to be true, I don't deserve good friends. It seems like every person out there in the whole wide world is unsafe. How did I end up here again? I can't believe it. Like, please do your best not to have any of that, like, come and, like, invade your life, okay? And immediately, but casually, go gray rock. It works. Now, when I showed up in those relationships and I became the scapegoat, I'm going to tell you right now, Shelly, that it's not going to be pretty because when I backed out of that friendship and began, you know, there was the paragraph after paragraph of like eight different text messages and I would respond with like two sentences and then there's like the six or eight text messages and I respond with like one sentence or I'm not available to meet up or, you know, I, I just slowly but surely backed out of that. And I got guilted. I got sent that I can't believe you. I thought we were friends, blah, 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 blah. You know, it figures. I should have known. You know, all the, all the things, right? But if you're being scapegoated, these people are not healthy. Because newsflash for all of us on this channel, <gasps> healthy people don't scapegoat others. Who knew? Right? Who knew? If you're here and you're a scapegoat, in all relationships, healthy people don't scapegoat others. Only toxic people scapegoat others. It turns out healthy people treat other people with respect and consideration and kindness. And they're respectful of your boundaries. And when you say, oh, you know what? I would really love to, but I just I can't commit right now. I have a tendency to overcommit. And I promised myself that I just wouldn't continue to overcommit. So while I am flattered and, and just really um, thankful that you're reaching out and that you want to connect, I just can't commit to that at this time. Maybe next time. For those of you who are like having like butterflies and like your heart is beating out of your chest because you can't picture yourself ever doing that, I am like the poster child for like People Pleasers Anonymous and for the first 40 years of my life I couldn't even speak that sentence without having like sweaty palms and needing like a new shirt or at least some extra deodorant. Okay, so it is quite empowering when you immediately and casually back away, you go gray rock and then you begin becoming less available to people who have a tendency to scapegoat you or to give you all of their responsibilities. Because guess what? We're only responsible for ourselves. Isn't that interesting? We were trained and taught so differently. We took responsibility for so many other people. But guess what? We're only responsible for ourselves. It's like amazing. Such a revelation. So this is hard. This is painful. I am not making light of this. I am simply bringing some levity to a very deep and painful topic. And that is that when we are being scapegoated, not only is it triggering and reminiscent of the way we were treated for so many years, but it is also very disempowering. It zaps us of all of our energy. We feel like we just need to lay on the ground and just go like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do right now? This totally sucks. But if you're feeling that way, just know it's not permanent. I swear it's not permanent. Because I've been there. I've been there. I swear I've been there. And now, when situations like that come up and I find myself in a situation, I realize, oh my goodness, how did I end up here again? <sighs> and then I feel myself start to shame myself. And I go, you know what? I'm going to release myself from that commitment. I'm going to release myself from that commitment. I reach out to the other person and I say, you know what, I'm really sorry to do this at the last minute or with such short notice, but I'm not going to be able to, to, hold, 
to hold our commitment. I'm not going to be able to show up at such and such a time. And um, I apologize. I know this puts you in a bind. Um, I hope you'll accept my apology. I have a tendency to overcommit, and I, I need to release myself from this commitment right now. Maybe next time. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to tell you something that is transformational. When you find someone on the other end of that conversation that responds with, that's okay, I completely understand, I've been there. That is when you know that you maybe have found a healthy-ish person or friendship or relationship. Okay? Maybe. <laughs> I'm not saying that's the only litmus test, okay? <laughs> that's not the only grid. It's not the only litmus test for, like, healthy people. But I am saying that when you politely decline or respectfully apologize and release yourself from a commitment, guess what? It doesn't reflect every flaw that you have inside your mind. It reflects your humanness. And someone else that is human will respond in kind and say, I'm disappointed, but I understand. I look forward to connecting another time. So that might not have been what you all wanted to hear, but it's the truth. So I had to share it with you. Joey says, I had my mother over for Thanksgiving, and she was actually nice to me. Maybe too nice. Now I'm waiting for something bad to happen because she is never super nice. Unless she wants something. How do I calm that paranoia while waiting for mom to drop the bomb? Am I wrong for feeling this way? The only reason why I had her over is because I felt like I had to. I was feeling that I would be the ungrateful daughter forward slash granddaughter. So this is a very long multifaceted question which I could do a four part series on just this question or topic alone, Joey. So I don't want to rob you of an amazing answer, but I want I will be as succinct as possible in answering all of these questions. I'm going to go rapid fire. Okay, Joey? I know you understand. I love you, girl. So you had your mother over for Thanksgiving. If you all have been here for a while, we know that, that Joey's mother has very pronounced narcissistic tendencies and tends to be rather exploitative and abusive and... Um, scapegoating of Joey. So um, later on in the narrative of this question you mentioned that you only had her over out of obligation which means that you violated your own interpersonal boundary and that's okay we're all a work in progress right? Um, but you say something really really interesting here. How do I calm that paranoia? I wouldn't calm that paranoia. <laughs> that, par that thing that you're calling paranoia is someone else's word. You have an inner critic that's telling you that you have paranoia. But what we, your community, your family, your loved ones that want what's best for you, what we call that is discernment. So you have discerned that you have an unsafe person on your hands. I want to encourage you to trust yourself. I will leave it at that. You did what you did. You survived it. Here you are. You're here just a couple days later. Right? Cue the hallelujah chorus. I'm just going to say, moving forward, let's maybe release ourselves from a commitment and not do anything out of obligation. But bottom line, you survived, and I want you to trust yourself. If you yourself feel like someone might not be a safe person, trust yourself. I challenge you, Joey. I've given you like weeks of homework before. So your only homework this week is to trust that little voice inside that you're calling paranoia via your inner critic that happens to be your mother or your grandmother and just trust that that's your discernment and learn to trust yourself and 
for all of you that are going to say, but how do I trust myself? Harriet, would you please pop up the thumbnail <laughs> that says um, healing our intuition, root congruence. So the way we heal our intuition and learn to trust ourselves is by remaining in alignment with ourselves, by establishing some interpersonal boundaries, things that we decide we will allow or not allow, and then abiding by them and respecting them as though they matter, because we do matter, but we've been taught that we don't but we need to learn that we do. So does that make sense? I think it does. Broken Childhood says, I am working on boundaries. I am learning which I need on my healing journey. Yes, boundaries are key, uh, Broken Childhood. Boundaries are so key. So we have interpersonal boundaries, like the, we have personal boundaries, right? Boundaries that we have within ourselves. Um, what we allow, what we don't allow, what we, allow ourselves to eat or drink or think or say or or do, right? And then we have those um, interpersonal boundaries, right, with other people. So personal boundaries and we have interpersonal boundaries um, with other people. What we allow them to say or do or, um, or if we allow them to touch us or to not touch us, like physical and, you know, emotional and verbal boundaries. And then um, there, I think, the only way that you're going to know which boundaries you need on your journey um, is to just start small. Like you could start, um, I don't know, it's been a while. Like Broken Child had asked this question a half hour ago. I'm, I'm hoping they're still here. So if you're still here, I'm answering your question. And you can start with just one. You can start with just one and then move from there. So start with I and choosing to not allow other people to speak to me or treat me in a way that I would not speak to or treat other people. I will not allow people to speak to me or treat me in a way that I would never speak or treat another person. In other words, if you are the type of person that speaks in a conversational tone and is uplifting and kind and encouraging to others, and you would never even think to be the type of person that would be vulgar or loud or unkind or belittling or berating or bullying of others, then when someone, anyone, doesn't matter who they are, parent, sibling, adult child, aunt, uncle, neighbor, community member, whenever anyone treats you in a way that you would not treat someone else, then perhaps immediately, yet casually, gray rock, low contact, no contact. Just start small. And then once you establish one boundary, it's like super empowering and it feels really good <laughs> and you can build upon that one boundary and I, I forgot to mention this earlier boundaries are something that take a lot of time and a lot of practice they don't happen automatically they don't happen quickly and we don't ever get them right the first time <laughs> rarely do we get boundaries right the first time rarely if you guys know how to practice new boundaries and get them right the first time, I need to take, a, you need to do like a six week class or like a workshop and I need to be your, your, your student. Because while I have been working at this boundaries game for 10 years, going on 10 years now, I still struggle with getting boundaries right the first time. It takes me a couple of tries to like get them right. Kind of like, learning how to drive a stick shift, a manual transmission. Rarely does someone get into a car, even if they've watched 12 YouTube videos on how to drive a stick shift, until you like feel the clutch and the gas pedal and the brake like with your own feet and you feel the gear shift and like you got like the whole thing and like you know you got the steering wheel, the whole, unless you're like doing it like, you're probably going to stall. Like, you're going to stall a couple times. 
you're going to be like, oh, darn it. And you're going to start the car, and then hopefully someone will, like, catch it on camera because you're, like, learning how to, like, you know, drive a manual transmission or whatever. So boundaries are the same way. Boundaries are the same way. Rarely do we get them right the first time and then just go from there, right? It's going to take a couple of tries before we, before we learn how to establish and maintain healthy boundaries. First of all, we don't even, like, if you're starting from square one like I was at age 34, you're going to be like, boundary? What's a boundary? What do you mean boundary? Like, what is that? <laughs> That was me 10 years ago. And now here I am, like, I'm like, you know, boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. It's like one of my favorite topics because they're life changing. They're super life changing. So start small. And um, that one boundary that I just shared about not allowing people to treat you or talk to you in certain ways, um, that's a huge one. And it, you can build upon that one. So, um, and if someone treats you or speaks to you in a way that isn't appropriate that you've decided, then, like I said, immediately but casually, Gray rock, low contact, no contact. And then boom. You feel much better. All of a sudden you feel sane. You feel healthier. You're just like, oh my goodness, this is like a whole new world. Right? I just had the Disney song. I just had, was it Aladdin? A whole new world? Oh my gosh, don't make me sing. I had a choir performance last night. So Dana says... My father, who is an addict, wants me to come to my aunt's house for Christmas lunch at her house. Her son was one of my perpetrators, and he abused me for many years. I don't know what to do. Dana, I want to strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you um, to give yourself permission to release yourself from that commitment. Um, Unless your father, who is an addict, unless he is in recovery and he is dedicated to his addiction recovery, he may not be a safe person for you to be around. Um, and you might not have any protection at your aunt's house, um, especially with this other. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't even go around a, a, someone who was a, an abuser of mine. Um, I, I would politely decline and, um, and say, thank you so much for inviting me. I just, I don't think that I am. I'm able to attend. And if you absolutely are like you're dying and you just can't say no, then I would attend and give yourself permission to only stay for a very short period of time, but never if you're in danger. If you're in danger, you're, if your mental and emotional well-being is being compromised, if your physical well-being is being compromised, if there is no protection, there's no reason that we need to go hang out with addicts that are not in recovery and don't have the ability to be fully present for us. There's no reason for it. We deserve to be around other people who have the ability to be emotionally available and we don't need to surround ourselves or allow ourselves to be in an environment where our well-being, mental, emotional, physical, or otherwise, is being compromised. There's there's just no, no need. But if you, that you feel the strong pull that you just need to go, then schedule a call with someone and give yourself permission to show up and say, oh, you know what, like, I really need to take this. I'm so sorry. You know, love you. Bye. And then just, you know, release yourself and leave. And then take a deep breath and reward yourself in whatever way you can because you honored yourself and because you're worth it. And celebrate celebrate you. That's what I recommend. And I'm not saying this is easy, you guys. This is all very hard. None of this is easy. This is all hard. This is all advanced level. There's none of this is, there's no beginning level to like trauma recovery. You're like in, boom, in the trenches. Boom. That's it. It's like all hard. Seriously. If you go through patches that aren't as debilitating as others, but man, move through it, move through, move through the muck, move through it. Because we can't go over it, under it, or around it. We have to move through it. And it's never easy. But man, is it worth it. So worth it, I promise. I promise it's worth it. 
So Kimberly says, when I have body memories, most of the time I am grounded, yet the pain is there and it doesn't stop hurting. What can I do to stop the pain of them after they start? Ooh, Kimberly, body memories are so, 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 so difficult. For those of you who don't know what body memories are, ooh, Harriet, could you pop up the video, um, the video card um, for the video we did on body memories? Um, yeah. So, you guys, body memories are really debilitating. And they're physical manifestations of past trauma and present trauma. And Kimberly, I'm going to share with you um, what I said um, a little bit earlier. And that is, if you can find a way, like we, when I talked a little bit earlier um, in the video, I don't know the actual number, like if this were a replay, someone would have posted in the comment section, um, they would have said, they would tag you, hey Kimberly, click this link and it will take you back to the part of the video where Athena discusses calming boxes and how to bring yourself out of a flashback um, through scents and tastes and or through um, touchstones, things that use your senses so that you are not stuck in that painful body memory. The most important thing for you, Kimberly, in this moment is for you to address the physical pain, address the physical manifestation immediately to the best of your ability and care for yourself physically. Perfect example, I have a client. Um, her husband is going through um, surgery today. Today. And she is having some body memories. She's having some physical manifestations of trauma. And she had to literally, on the day of her husband's surgery, today, the 27th of November, um, 2017, she had to schedule an appointment to go see her doctor and get a shot of cortisone because it was so debilitating. Her hip was so debilitating. She was having um, some body memories and it had affected her hip in a really, really, really bad way. And so here she was, you know, she needs to be the supporter, right? And her husband's in surgery, but she had to, to go and care for herself. And I can honestly say that, you know, that's a, that's a powerful thing. That's a wonderful thing that she did for herself. Now, does it make her an unloving, uncaring spouse that, you know, she wasn't, you know, staying right there, et cetera, and like, you know, the whole time? No. Like, I'm, I'm certain. I am 100% certain because her husband is on a recovery journey and he's healthy. He's becoming healthier by the day. I know that he would say, you know what? I know you love me and I'm glad you took care of yourself in that moment. I don't want you to be in any unnecessary pain. So she, I mean, she had to go get shots of cortisone. So um, the most important thing, Kimberly, is for you to take care of your physical body. Um, take care of your physical body in that moment as much as you possibly can. Very, very, very important for sure. Julie says, on the topic of handling the holidays, we usually spend them with my husband's abuser and other family. We found it helpful to develop an exit strategy for when we were triggered. Yes. Yes. Exit strategies for the win. Yes, 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 yes. You guys, this is big. Thank you, Julie. So exit strategies. So if you guys are not if you guys are not familiar with an exit strategy, it can it can it can take on um, it can look different ways to different people. So an example of an exit strategy that isn't holiday related necessarily, um, but it can be. We can borrow it from uh, you know safe dating safe dating tips. Okay. So back in the day, back in the day when I was single, and there are many of us here on this channel that are single. So whenever I would go out on like a, a, a new date, like if I would get invited to do something with somebody new that I didn't know, I would have a safe person that I would, that, that would actually call me while I'm on the date. Now obviously this is just within the past like 17 years because hello cell phones, right? Um, what was it, 99, 2000 is when all of us started, you know, basically having the cell phone. I know they came out sooner. I don't need the nasty comments of like, what's your problem? You don't know when cell phones came out. 
I'm just saying that for the common folk like myself, I didn't have a cell phone until like 99 or 2000. And so back in like 99 or 2000 when I was like single-ish, um, and even like maybe a little bit before that, maybe a little bit before that, like late 90s. And then even after that, like I just made sure that if I was going out on a date with somebody new, that I would make sure that my phone would buzz or ring, like so that they could say, how's it going? Is everything okay? And then by my response, like I could either say, you know what, I'm so sorry. Um, this is very unexpected. That was my friend. I'm, I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to go. Thank you so much. Um, I apologize. And I was able to release myself from this commitment, right? That was probably like back before I really knew what a boundary was, but I was like practicing safety and boundaries before I knew what safety and boundaries were. It was just something that felt smart to do. So if we borrowed a tip from the safe dating playbook and we applied it to holidays for survivors, it would look very similar. It would be a community member that you know is safe and they would text you or call you shortly after you arrived or like, like Julie says, her and her family, her, her now her husband and children, they plan an exit strategy for when they are triggered because they show up at the home of her husband's abuser for holidays. So if you know you're going into a situation where there's going to be an abuser present or someone who's toxic or a situation where you know that you may feel um, minimized or small or uncared for or unsafe or unprotected, then set yourself up for success in a way that makes sense for you. What is your version? What is your version of, hey, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, I have, I have, to, I have to go, I, I apologize, um, I'm going to have to release myself from this commitment that we had, um, I do apologize. I never lied, I never lied and said, oh my goodness, my friend's dog is, is dying and I need to leave and I'll totally call you. Like, I didn't do that, no, I just said, I'm really sorry, this is, it's my friend and I'm going to need to release myself from this commitment. I really apologize. Respectful, kind, truthful, in alignment with yourself, right? Remain in alignment with yourself. I'm not sitting here telling you to be false or to be like your abusers or to lie, turn into liars. And I'm not, I'm not telling you to do all of those things. I'm telling you to take care of yourself, take care of your body, take care of your soul, take care of your mind. Remember who you are. Remember what your identity is. Remember what your identity is. Remember the truth about yourself, who you really are, what you really care about, okay? What your priorities are, how far you've come, how hard you've worked in your recovery. Those are the things you need to remember during this holiday season. Those are the things. Those are the habits that are going to get you through this valley, through the muck, and come out the other side so you can help other people feel better, feel stronger, and cultivate healthier relationships. So I hope this has been helpful, you guys. That was the last question. Um, I am, I'm right on, I'm actually on time, you guys. Can you believe I'm on time? I actually have like 10 minutes to spare. This is unbelievable. I'm so excited. Oh, good. The audio is okay. I'm hope, I was hoping the audio would be okay, you guys. My goodness. So um, thank you also. I wanted to say thank you to um, so many of you guys sent me um, Thanksgiving messages. Um, I, I tried to send out a, a personal, uh, uh, I wrote a very brief, like kind of a, a Thanksgiving message to um, people that had subscribed to the email list. Um, I'll, I'll, let me read that to you guys since we're on the topic of holidays, okay? Um, so I wrote this, I wrote this to all of our community members that had subscribed 
to our um, my email list through CPTSD Foundation and No More Shame Project and Trauma Recovery University. And I want to read it to you really briefly, if that's OK. Because it's for all of you guys, even if you haven't subscribed. And if you haven't subscribed and you want to subscribe, I don't send out emails. This is like the first one I've sent out in like four years, I think. Maybe the second. This is the second email in like four years. I know that's horrible. I should keep in closer touch, right? But um, So I won't spam you is all I'm saying. But let me read this to you. Um, this is on Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, my husband went to go volunteer at our church and um, serve. We serve like 600 people at our church. We provide a community meal that's free for everybody to come that doesn't have family or like money to pay for food. And there were 600 people. It was amazing. But I normally volunteer and I didn't. I chose to stay home and email everybody. So there were 5,142 of you. And so I'm really excited. But um, or 46, 5,146 of you. And this is what I wrote to you. And if you didn't receive it, then I apologize. But um, you can go to cptsdfoundation.org, and you can click to sign up. And then I can email you once in the next four years, or twice in the next four years, maybe. Maybe maybe more often. I should keep in better touch. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this video on time. I'm going to speak quickly. So this is what I wrote on Thanksgiving. Today, I want to intentionally pause to wish you and yours a peace-filled day. In the U.S., where I reside, almost everyone is celebrating a day of Thanksgiving and togetherness. For so many, though, the winter holidays can be a particularly painful time of year, a time of despair, longing, and separation. So today, whether you are resting or working, together or apart from loved ones, thriving or struggling, I will sit with you if you'd like me to. I'm hoping this brief message reaches you in the manner in which it was intended, which is one of sincere compassion, empathy, and gratitude for your life. Wherever you are in the world, I am hoping and praying today is a good enough day for you. I hope today can be peaceful for you because you deserve it, because you are worth it. Just a quick note to say I appreciate you. Thank you for being a valuable part of my family my friendly family of choice, a valuable part of this rapidly growing online healing community of compassionate individuals. With sincere gratitude for your life today, Athena Moberg, cptsdfoundation.org. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> you probably couldn't see it. <laughs> but anyway, I sent that um, message out to everybody. And I didn't use like an autoresponder crazy, like, you know, I just, I sent it from my normal email. Um, and I only got a couple of people that, that wanted me to remove them. I only got one really, really, well, I got a couple of really nice responses and then a couple of very unsolicited, just really kind, wonderful messages just out of nowhere it was such a blessing so thank you you guys know who you are the ones who sent it and then I sent a personal thank you like like just a really 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 brief one individually to like a whole bunch of individual people like probably like 60 of you that had emailed me previously and we had been corresponding uh, I sent like a really brief like I'm thankful for you type of a thing like just super quick but um I wanted to share um this is reminiscent I'm going to read to you one of the uh, one of the um, really nasty responses I got. Only because I want to share this with you because I want you to know how often I receive messages like this, and I didn't respond to this at all, other than to say, "I am so very sorry. My apologies." That's it. Um, but these are messages that I receive on a regular basis regarding our videos. <laughs> but this one is in response to the, the email. Um, she had opted in and like signed up for something previously, like over the last few years. Um, but she is 100% sure in this email that I'm spamming her. And I, and I wasn't intending to spam. I even put a little note at the very bottom that said, if you don't want to receive anything from me, just 
reply with one word, remove, and I will never email you again, I promise, right? But um, she said, this is spam to me. I am Canadian, and most Americans rarely, if ever, know when we celebrate Thanksgiving, which, by the way, I do. It's the first or second, maybe I don't, because it's the first or second Monday in October, and I can't remember which one. So she's right. I am an uneducated American. She says, anyway, my main point is unsubscribe me because I have no clue why this email landed in my inbox. Unsubscribe me. Canadians, not that Americans, can see past their crumbling empire mess of a country need to just stop inundating us with your very tragic culture and world dominating politics and super look in the mirror at the at the ta tactic but laughable delusion called American exceptionalism because it's crazy as most citizens of Canada, Britain, Australia, etc. we know all too well. Um, I never subscribe to this email and this this email really pushes me further past how much more, as in none, American whatever the fuck that I just can't give priority to. P.S. Even if you weren't American, I hate spam. <laughs> so I just responded, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So I get messages like that on a regular basis, you guys, because I'm American, and I can't not be. Um, but I just want you to know from the bottom of my heart that I will continue to show up here, and I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and even if those types of messages <laughs> continue to flow in, which I know they're going to, um, I care about you. And I'm going to continue to show up, and I'm going to continue to provide support. And this person that wrote me this particular message, they're in a lot of pain, right? Um, they're in a lot of pain. And maybe they are receiving a lot of unsolicited, horrible messages from a whole bunch of different Americans. And for that, I am, I am personally sorry. Like, I can't speak for my whole country, but... I do know that a lot of us are very uneducated, myself included, and it does appear as though we don't care about other people and we shove things down people's throats, and I'm not proud of that. But I will say this. I'm doing my best to, to change that view, and I will continue to do my best to change that view. And uh, I hope I never come across as though I don't care about other people. And... Um, I hope that you guys all know that I'll do my best to continue improving um, in every area of my life, personally and professionally, so that I can provide a safe environment for you guys to attend, show up, get your questions answered, hang out, and meet other people that are on the same journey as you're on. Because there's power in community. You, you really do heal at an exponential rate when you're surrounded by others that are on the same journey as you. So thank you so much for being here. I look forward to seeing you here again next week, Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have week two of um, winter holidays, healthy habits for survivors, how to make it through the, the holidays. Um, and if you're interested in like a daily um, support group for um, winter holidays for survivors, there is a member of our community. His name is Matt. Um, he's running a survivor holiday support group, and um, I believe it's on Facebook. So if you're not the Facebook type of person, then don't reach out to him. I know so many of you email me, and you're like, I hate Facebook. I'm never going to go there. Rawr. So, But if you are on Facebook and you're interested, reach out to Matt. Um, you can go over to beyondyourpast.com. And there should be a button somewhere that says, like, holiday support or something like that. And I think it's a daily support group that he's offering for the winter holidays. It goes through January. Um, I don't know the cost. I, I, don't, I don't know all the details. But I do know he's offering it. And um, he's a trusted member of our community. He will ensure that it's a safe space for you if you need, like, daily 
more than just once a week show up and get your question answered on YouTube type of a thing. So anyway, just thought I would throw that out there. Um, that's my, my shameless plug, I guess. I wasn't intending on shamelessly or shamefully plugging anybody. But um, <laughs> I hope that you guys will be back here next Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, and to talk about the holidays and how we can make it through in a healthy way, honor our commitments to our own selves and our own recovery journey, uh, and keeping the toxic people out of our lives so that we can heal, because we are worth it. We deserve to heal. So um, I'll see you back here, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, every single Monday. Um, and uh, I just love being here with you guys. So thanks for, for showing up. And if this is a replay, give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment below so I know you were here. Okay, bye you guys.